One researcher, Dr. Ed Lewis of Caltech, studied this question for 30 years by crossbreeding thousands of flies. Lewis's work led him to a controversial idea. He proposed that a surprisingly simple mechanism was shaping embryos. He wrote that each segment of the fly was being directed to grow by a single gene. A small set of genes, a kind of genetic toolkit, appeared to be laying out the entire body. And as you looked at these genes, you said, this one affects this part of the body, this affects the next part of the body, and this affects the next part of the body. That was an astonishing observation. It was astonishing because it seemed too simple. Nobody else thought single genes were powerful enough to control something as complex as the structure of the body. Skeptics argued that Lewis's idea was guesswork. Of course, he had never seen the genes, because the techniques to do so didn't exist. From the 1920s to the 1970s, it was not possible to physically isolate any specific gene. That opportunity first became available, fortunately for me, at the time that I was a student. And so many of us thought, wow, we can finally dig in there and identify these really mysterious genes. Levine enlisted his friend and fellow scientist, Bill McGuinness. The first gene they went after had an unusual name, Antennapedia, which means antenna leg. The gene was thought to control the growth of legs. When the gene misfired, Flies grew legs in the wrong place, on their heads, in place of antennae. In normal flies, legs grow from the midsection, the area called the thorax. So Levine and McGuinness decided to hunt for the gene in the thorax of a normal embryo. The expectation is that antennapedia would be active, expressed in the thorax, the developing thorax of the embryo. But who knew? Levine and McGuinness had to do something no one had ever done before. They had to find a way to see a gene in action. We wanted to light up the gene. And it was very painstaking work. The project called for new and untested methods. At first, it didn't work very well, and there were a number of technical uh, problems to solve. The team had to find a delicate balance of radioactive probes and toxic enzymes. Too much of either would destroy the embryos. The process was not very gratifying on a day-by-day -day basis. Unbelievably tedious. It took months of trial and error. People often said, you know, you should try something else. You know, this is too long shot. You know, you're, gonna, you're just wasting your time. Uh, but we kept going. Finally, late one night, all the work paid off. And there was this moment when we saw that the gene was turned on in a band in the middle of a very early embryo. This had never been seen before. The antennapedia gene was acting like a master switch, turning on the segment of the embryo that would become the thorax. The implications were mind-boggling. If single genes like Antennapedia could define whole segments of an animal, these genes were acting like architects of the body. And if one of these genes turned on in the wrong place, striking changes to the body could result. 
It seemed that Lavina McGuinness had uncovered the genes responsible for the evolution of bodies. But there were still doubts. The work had all been done in fruit flies. What about other animals? Did they use the same mechanism to build their bodies? An answer would come from Switzerland. In 1994, Walter Gehring of the University of Basel isolated the gene that triggered the growth of eyes in fruit flies. The gene was called eyeless, because flies without it developed with no eyes. Gehring knew of a gene in mice that worked in the same way. He wondered, were the two genes the same? And this question we tested by taking the mouse gene and putting it into fruit flies to see whether flies can understand the message of the mouse. Gehring replaced a fly's gene for eyes with the mouse gene. And to everybody's surprise, the mouse gene works perfectly well and can induce a compound eye in the fruit fly. The fruit fly grew normal fruit fly eyes using a gene from a mouse. Not only did the two creatures use the same mechanism, they used the same gene. This was the mechanism behind extra wings, legs sprouting from heads, and Bateson's deformed animals. The century-long search was complete. The genetic engine of the body's evolution turned out to be a tiny handful of powerful genes. So what this means is, is in some ways, some sense, evolution is a simpler process than we first thought. When you think about all of the diversity of forms out there, we first believed that this would involve all sorts of novel creations, starting from scratch, again and again and again. We now understand that no, that, that evolution works with uh, packets of information and uses them in new and different ways and new and different combinations without necessarily having to invent anything fundamentally new but new combinations. Suddenly, the commonality of form among animals was understood. Animals resembled each other because they all used the same set of genes to build their bodies. A set of genes inherited from a common ancestor that lived long ago. And what we see now among all the animals are just variations on a body plan that existed half a billion years ago. And there's only one inescapable conclusion you can draw from that, which is if all of these branches have these genes, then you have to go to the base of that, which is the last common ancestor of all animals. And you deduce it must have had these genes. So the whole radiation of animals, the whole spring of animal diversity has been fed by essentially the same set of genes. Ed Lewis shared the Nobel Prize in 1995 for the discovery of the universal set of genes that builds the bodies of animals. And so yes, it came as a, as a, as a, as a huge surprise, not only to people like my mother, who says, my God, an earthworm and a mouse, an earthworm and me, you know, share things in common. But it came as a surprise to other scientists that there was this profound conservation of mechanism, of building embryos among all these different kinds of animals. What about us? Our bodies are built from the same genes that build all other animals. Yet, we are different. No other animal designs or creates like we do. We seem so special. It's hard not to think that we're somehow an exception to evolution. But of course, we're not. The transformation that led to us was no different from other transformations. <laughs> 